we started on the characteristics of a true Christian. And there were eight that were listed. There were more characteristics. Obviously, you can go through the Word and find more, but these eight seem to give a good foundation. I'm going to go over them real quickly. A true Christian, first of all, is saved. And you're saved by grace through faith and not by your own works. You don't go to heaven by being a good person. You go to heaven by being a person who gives their life to the Lord and just receives the free gift. Can you hear me all right in the back? They say some in the front. We're having a hard time. Okay. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not even faith is of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of any works, so that you shouldn't boast, because God wants it to be a free gift to you. The second characteristic is a true Christian imitates God. In Ephesians 5.1, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. In addition to that, a true Christian obeys the Lord. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. A true Christian does not conform to the world's standards. Romans 12, 2, And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, and that's as, far, that's as far as I'm going to take it right now. We went over the first two last week. True Christians, an imitator of God. Since Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father, any Jesus people are going to see, not hear about, but see, is going to be reflected in the lifestyle and the attitude of Christians. Now, we're not perfect. We're always growing and we're always changing. But it's important for us to go out of our way to try and emulate the characteristics of Christ. The Bible tells us to be an imitator of God. It wouldn't tell us to do that if we did not have the capability in order to do that. Otherwise, God would be unjust. But remember, the commandments that we obey, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It said all the law is wrapped up in those two commandments. You won't covet your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's goods. You won't want to kill someone. You won't want to dishonor the, the Lord's day if you, if you walk in love towards God and you walk in love towards others. It'll bless you. It will bless you. And God will bless you in return. So it should be easy to obey the Lord. John chapter 14 and verse 15 says this, If you love me, keep my commandments. How many here have a, would have a hard time loving the Lord and loving your neighbor? Now sometimes loving your neighbor is a chore. Sometimes your neighbors give you many, many reasons to not want to walk in love towards them. Some of us want to just love them from a great distance. But we still have to love them. It's sometimes you might not like people, but you have to love them. You say, well, that sounds like a contradiction. God hated our sin, but he loved us so much that he died. He gave himself for us. Paul said, my love's not my own. I've been bought with a price. Therefore, I glorify God in my body. He was living for man before he met Christ. He was living for rules and for regulations. They drove him. They drove him to murder. They drove him to imprisoning good people. But then when he ran into the Savior on the road to Damascus, he had a God encounter. And instead of being judged... He was asked to serve. He met a God of love. And he allowed, his, he allowed God in and his entire life changed. And the life of many, many, many people over the years have changed because of the words that are in the Bible. So you'd stop and think, a true Christian 
It's saved by grace. Well, what does that saved by grace mean? We found out, and I'm going to just go over quickly. The word grace or saved, excuse me, is the word sozo. I'm going to give you the definition of what happens when you get born again. Because God never ever asks you to walk in something without there being a blessing for it on the other side. There is a blessing for everything. There's a scripture that says, honor your mother and father that it may go well with you and that you may have long life. How many of you here would like to live longer? Amen. Very few people do I run into who are sane want to give up one day. They want to stretch out that life as much as possible. Now, they may not live like they want that. And I, have, I had lots of aunts and uncles uh, from the World War II generation that loved to smoke. And uh, one uncle, four packs a day, unfiltered, just... And he wanted to live a long time, but he kept smoking. And they told him, you need to stop. He went into the hospital. They gave him an uh, experimental operation. They scraped, uh, scraped his lungs. I'm not going to go into details like that. But he was given more life. He could have had years more. But he liked to smoke so bad, before he even got out of the hospital, he was smoking again two packs a day by then. How he did that, that was at the VA hospital. I have no idea. Well, we all want to live longer, but how funny it is that so often, even though we want to live longer, we're not willing to make the changes necessary to live longer. Now, people say, well, it's my diet. I've got to stop eating this. I've got to stop uh, eating that. I've got to stop drinking this. I've got to stop drinking this. I've got to start exercising. You know, I've got to stop getting angry. I've got to find a job with less stress. I've got to, you know, I've got to start jogging every day, or I've got to start lifting weights, or whatever it may and we're working on all these things for longer life. And the Lord says, I've got a good one for you. Honor your mother and father, and it will go well with you, and you'll have long life. Now, that's a lot easier than giving up pizza. Isn't it? I mean, if you don't like pizza, think of something you like. But God gives you a commandment and then an incredible blessing with long life. Now, what you've got to understand about that is the Bible says in John chapter 10.10, 10, it says the devil comes for no other reason except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now, we've all experienced that, either some of us personally, depending on the kind of lifestyles we may have chosen at different times of their life, different periods. Uh, I've been through many different periods before I finally surrendered my life to God. And I can tell you the time I've spent with the Lord has been a whole lot better than the time I spent with the devil. God's much better company. And he doesn't lie like the devil. But in, it says, I, he said in that same verse, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And the thing is, we need to remember, we look at that and say, oh, okay, I, abundant life. Uh, I've got bill problems, uh, you know, the, the, kids, the kids are sick, this is going on, that's going on. I don't know if I want more of that. But that word life in the Bible is a word zoe. A literal translation of that word is life as God knows it. Life as God knows it, or life as God has it. Now, we can't have the fullness of that until we're finally in heaven forever. But the Bible promises us health, it promises us blessings and prosperity. It promises us peace. It promises us protection. There's much that God promises as part of life his way. That will make your life sweeter. So when he's promising you long life, as he did in that verse about honoring your mother and father, he's saying the life that I'm wanting to extend is a life of blessing. There's another scripture in the Old Testament that said, the plans that I have for you are for good and not for evil. Plans to bless you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a successful end. That's the kind of extended life he wants to give us. And it's there and it's available for us. We just have to decide to receive him and walk in it. Honor your mom and dad. So, well, I don't particularly like my mom or my dad at any given moment in life. And I can remember there were times as a little boy after I did something I thought was okay and my parents decided that it wasn't. 
that my, my dad would apply the Board of Education to the seat of learning. And when I got up from that event, I, you know, I, I hated my dad for about 10 minutes, at least until the sting went away. And uh, you know, we don't always get along with people we're called to love, but we love by decision. Love's not a feeling. You can ask any married person. They'll tell you. If, if they have an understanding, love is a decision because the warm tinglies you have while you're dating and you're going through the whole anticipation thing and you finally get married and go through the wedding night and those first few months of, you know, of, of wedded bliss, you know, it's, it's a lot different today because so many people just live together and they, they miss the whole blessing of, uh, of God on a marriage. But traditionally... The, that's exciting. That's the exciting part. The planning, it may be hectic, but the bride's so excited about the planning of the wedding. And we've just gone through that recently with Josh and Mackenzie. And uh, the excitement of the, of, you know, the wedding day and the festivities and then the honeymoon and those first few months of establishing your home and so forth. And a new child comes and that's all exciting. But then there's the sameness that falls into a marriage. Anybody here ever experienced that? After a while, marriage is not surprising. It's almost like going to a job. I know what I'm going to experience at work. You know, it's going to be the same next Wednesday as it was this Wednesday. And marriage can seem that way. It really can. But love is unaffected by that. Because love is not an emotion. Love is a decision. Love is a decision. Now, will you have emo will it affect your emotions? Well, it's sure it can affect your emotions, obviously. God gives us body chemistry, and those things change. But when the warm tinglies go away, you don't have the same tinglies at 60 that you had at 20. You definitely don't at 80. I'm taking that on somebody else's info. I'm not, see, warm tinglies cover a multitude of areas. <laughs> but you get used to each other, and you start taking each other for granted, and, and uh, the, the, little, the little comments that used to get you excited all of a sudden become the same old, same old. So you have to make a decision to love. When they do something wrong, you have to remember, hey, did I do anything wrong? Should I really stay mad or... Uh, have I exhibited that same kind of, yeah, okay. I want forgiveness. They deserve forgiveness. I choose to love them. The Bible said that before, before we were saved, God loved us. When we were stinking ugly, when we smelled of sin, God loved us. So when, when you see a command from God, remember, the Bible says God is love. He extends love to us. He gave us love. He gave us his son. You, no greater love can anyone show, the Bible says, except they lay down their life for another, in which he did. So when he asks you and I to live right, get saved, your life is going to be better. Be an imitator of me. Your life is going to be better. I'm going to give you the things that pertain to life. And when hard times come, and they do come, because he never promised us that we were going to be like the Pharaoh's daughters floating down rafts on the Nile while giant Nubians fed them grapes or fanned them with a giant fig leaf. That's not life. Life, it, life has the good times and the hard times, but even then he'll be with us. And then we're coming to a time when those kind of hardships are going to end and, and things will be forever better. And as you look around, we seem to be getting closer. But today what I want to talk to you about is the blessing of obeying the Lord. That always sounds high. Every time I heard obey as a kid, it was like, oh, there was just something in me that obey. You know, and all of a sudden, I, after, I used to watch those old movies like 
uh, Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments, and I'd hear that word obey, and I'd see the slaves pushing the rocks, and you know, the Egyptian soldiers whipping them. That's what obey sounded like to me as a six-year-old and a seven-year-old. Obey, oh gosh, that means I can't go out and play. They want me to rake the lawn. They want me to help with the dishes. I only helped with the dishes once, and my mom decided that there was probably better things I could do without damaging the house. So, but obey sounds hard. You go in school, and you have to see, obey. You sit straight. You don't talk. Don't pass notes. Uh, get, nowadays, it's get off your cell phone, uh, if, if you're in a school that allows you to say those things anymore. Uh, all of that kind of stuff. You go to a job. These are the rules. You have to be in. You got to. You got to punch in by such and such a time, or you get docked so much time. You know, you 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 can't goof off. A 15-minute coffee break does not mean 25. You know, all of that stuff. You know, just the rules. The rules. You got to. You've got to be there. Uh, oh, we've got this great promotion to buy a new car. This special interest. You go. Oh, that's great. You get in there, and then they say, okay. By the way, there are all these other rules to make sure that you qualify. And one of the big qualifications is you've got to pay on time. There are all kinds of rules. Obey can sound like a burden. But in God's case, God never asks you to do something without blessing you. Now, think about this. In Luke chapter 11, verse 28, it says, Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Blessed are they. That word blessed, the Greek word, and I'm not Greek, so Bear with me on the pronunciation. Makareos. Makareos. It means fortunate, well off, happy, happier still. Fortunate, well off. If I say to you somebody, if I were to say to you that uh, Donald Trump is well off, you would understand that. Aristotle Onassis was well off. They have abundance. Blessed. So if I were to read that verse with all of its definition, God said, you believers, those of you who hear my word and obey it, you are fortunate, happy, well off, and happier still. That's his plan. Obedience in small things are what leads us to greater blessings. There's a verse that tells us that it's the little foxes that spoil a vineyard. Now, if, if you don't know anything about vineyards, or you don't, have, you, you don't live in a place where there are a lot of fox, young fox will, would go into a vineyard and they would dig around the roots and they were looking for those little tender filaments that come off the main roots and they would eat those because they were sweet but they were actually killing the vine because all the water came in and the nutrients came in through those little filaments. The very, the, what would look to you and I like insignificant things. And so what God says is, it's not the big things that are going to mess you up. Most married people have at least half a brain enough to know you, you don't commit adultery and think you're going to have a good marriage. That's right. Let's go. Right? You don't take your wife to a party and spend all night flirting with somebody else. Come on. And wives, the same goes for you. That's right. uh, you want a promotion at your job, but you're always late. You leave early. You never finish a project on time. You complain about your benefits. You complain about your wages. All the time, you're showing your dissatisfaction. And then you wonder why you get passed over for promotion or don't get a raise. That's not a good thing. That's, that's like, you're not going to get a greater blessing. If you're always calling in sick, don't expect to be looked at as somebody who's going to get a promotion or additional responsibilities that lead to greater promotion and greater respect. You don't have to work too many jobs to figure that out. And so what God says is, if you'll learn to obey in the little things, you'll receive the great blessings. It's not a big deal to get to work on time. 
It's not a big deal not to leave till your work shift is over. Those are little things. Those are easy things for us to do. He's not asking us to, to run a 20 mile marathon in order to get a paycheck. He's not asking us to run the office for minimum wage. So those little things that we do, if you work in customer service, being courteous. Now I know that's a novelty thought lately, uh, but courteous to the people that you, that you deal with, customers that come in, a smile. Well, I'll tell you what, you, when you meet a person and you smile and you greet them cheerfully, if they're down, it has a positive effect on them. You may not even know why they're down, but smiles do great things. Telling somebody God bless you and meaning it, smiling like you're happy to, to greet them. You, you may not know them for Adam, but you treat them like someone would treat a friend. It changes people. I guarantee you, if you've ever had it to you, it changed you, at least for that moment. It, you felt like you had more value. Wow. Somebody actually thought about me. And it blesses you. The big blessings come by habitually doing the small things. Walk in love. Don't be sarcastic. Negative humor is never a blessing. And it's probably the biggest form of humor that most guys practice. You know, that's, you say, well, what do you mean by negative humor? You've heard, you heard my story. Most of the people don't like my jokes. They all groan. Not again, Pastor. It's like, it's like the young girl who hadn't had a date. She was kind of plain, nice girl. She got asked out. She went out on a date. Her mother was all excited. And she went out with one of those guys. You know, where he'll say something funny, but it, it, it stings as much as it. She came in. Mom was a little concerned. She said, well, how was your date? She said, well, it was, it was good. It was okay. I said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I got a compliment, sort of. She said, well, what do you mean you got a compliment, sort of? What did he say? Well, he kind of said, I look like a fresh breath of spring. So what do you mean he kind of said it? Well, he said, yeah, he said, I look like the end of a hard winter. <laughs> Negative humor. How many of you get that? That's like a girl comes up to you and you say, you know, you've been out and say, well, what's your impression of the date? So one thing I can say about you for a fat guy, you don't, you don't sweat much. That's not a compliment, y'all. <laughs> Guys are good at that. My sister came to, and I don't advise these jokes because they do not work. They backfire. My sister came up to me once. She was <laughs> going out on a date. She hadn't been out for a really long time. And so she fixed herself all up and she was ready to go. And, and I, was, I was there and she had, she'd gone through a really rough patch. Uh, her first husband walked out on her on a neighbor and... Anyway, she was a single girl and I came in and I was babysitting the kids and she was going out for the first time in a long time instead of just taking care of the kids. I volunteered. So she fixed herself up and I've always been that one-liner, gee, I'm so funny kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, uh, unfortunately, not realizing that I was a lot closer to being insulting than I was to being funny. And she said, well, how do I look? I looked, I said, Pat, you look like a million bucks. And she got all excited and was all, and as I walked off, I said, but since I've never seen a million bucks, you look like something I've never seen. She, she almost caught me. <laughs> I literally had to run out of the house and beg forgiveness. But it's a little thing, isn't it? And people think that's funny. And I've watched people do these little negatives back and forth with one another. Ho, 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 ho. Oh, it's so funny. It's so funny. Husbands and wives will do that sometimes. And then all of a sudden, one of them, whether it's intentional or unintentional, says one of those negative, supposedly funny comments and hits your tender spot. And instead of letting it roll off your back, it's like a knife in your heart. Man, it's your wound.
We're called as believers to sow love, to sow blessing, to sow respect, to sow concern. I have no problem with humor as long as it elevates someone. Or it's not humor at somebody else's expense. We make comments, we jokingly, you know, somebody will come up and you can tell. And you, you, if you don't know the love of God, a lot of times you don't even know that the way you're acting isn't cheering them up. And you may, you may th- and the, obviously I, I'm, I'm a guy, so I, refl- I re, you know, relate to guy things. But my, some of my fraternity brothers, college buddies and stuff like that, you know, People would come in kind of down and you walk over and they say, what's the matter? I'm feeling down. This isn't good. And you kind of pop them on the shoulder and say, hey, don't worry about it. It's going to be worse tomorrow. So enjoy today. You know, ho, ho, ho. Did that help? Okay. So when you walk as a Christian and God says, don't lie. Well, I don't really lie. Really? I tell little white lies. Mm -mm. How many of you know that a a white lie is just a lie whitewashed? Mm -hmm. If you don't believe it, remember when you got caught by a parent or someone, did you do this? You did it. You blatantly did it. They didn't see you do it, but they see the evidence that it's been done, and they focused on you, probably because of your track record. And they look at you and say, did you do that? And you know if you say yes, you're going to get a ration. So you give a little white lie, since it was a small thing. No, I didn't do that. Now, they say, all right, I'll believe you this time. And you go off, and, and you think, boy, that's great. But you know what you just did? You demean your own character. That's right. That's right. And then if they ever find out that you really did it, you've lost respect. That's right. You say, well, I'd rather lose respect than get a ration. No, you wouldn't, not in the long run. In the long run, by being honest and just standing up like an adult and taking the consequences, two things will happen. One, they may be mad and you may get disciplined, but they'll respect you more and they, and they will believe you when you talk. The other thing it will do is it'll make you think about the way you act and start evaluating the benefits of something as opposed to the consequences. And it causes you to grow. Well, God says, if you'll obey me, I will bless you. I'll give you some examples. In small things, what happens? Often God's blessings come to us as a result of our willingness to do something that appears insignificant. Jesus was walking by himself. He just started teaching. He walked up onto the beach and he saw some fishermen and he started to talk to the people, to preach the good news. And they started to crowd him in and he turned around and there was a fisherman whose name was Peter. And he said, Peter, Let me use your boat and push out. That little thing. Peter did it. He was an unbeliever. By his own own confession, he was not a nice man. He was wicked. And yet, that one little thing of letting Jesus stand in his boat a few feet off the shore so that he wouldn't get crowded out into the water to teach the people... And he became one of the most well-known apostles. You know, you may not be able to to name all of the apostles, but you will definitely will remember Peter. One of the biggest blessings of his life came with, with, with just obeying a simple request of the Lord. How about this? 5,000 people needing to be fed who had followed Jesus and the disciples came and said, Lord, send them home, they're hungry. And he said, well, you feed them. We don't have that kind of money, Jesus. He said, well, what do you have? I got five loaves of bread and a few fish. 
And he took it. He said, bring it to me. He blessed it. A little boy gave them his meal. He blessed it and it fed. The Bible says it fed 5,000 plus women and children. A humongous miracle because some little boy was willing to give his food when Jesus asked for it. And the apostles got the benefit of handing it out and seeing it multiply as they handed it out. A small thing. He didn't say, I want you to go and I want you to go into the missions and I want you to be murdered by the natives and, you know, on behalf of the gospel. I want you to, you're, you're rich, I want you to sell everything you've got and I want you to live like a pauper and walk through the country and preach the word of God. No, he didn't ask you to do that either. He said, how much money do you have in the bank? Ten grand. Okay, I want you to write that check and give it to the church. He didn't ask you to do that. Five loaves, a few fish, thousands fed. You got to see a miracle and participate in it firsthand. It changed him forever. Putting, giving Jesus his boat for a few minutes. Changed him forever. Plus, if you remember the rest of the story, they hadn't caught anything all night. Jesus said, push out into the water a little further. He said, okay, let down your nets. And Peter's answer was, Jesus, we've been fishing all night. There ain't nothing out there. And he said, but since you ask me, little thing, I'll do it. So he threw the net out, expecting nothing. And when he went to pull it in, there was so much fish that he had to call his friends with their other boats to come over and help him get the fish into the boats. Small thing. How many seemingly insignificant things has the Lord asked you to do that you haven't attended to yet? How many little things? He said, oh yes, God told me to do this. I'll get to that, God. And it goes on the back of your mind and on the back burner and then out the door. And you don't do it. And every once in a while, the Holy Spirit kind of quickens you and says, yeah, don't you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Make a phone call. Go help somebody put their wood in. Uh, pay, the gro pay that old lady's small grocery bill in front of you. Little, little things, and we think about it, maybe we don't do it. Or just tell, just tell somebody Jesus loves them. And then you go before the Lord and you pray, and you ask God for a blessing, and boy, the blessing doesn't come. And you pray again, and it doesn't come, and it doesn't come. Uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this thought in you. Is it possible that a blessing that you've been needing from God that has not yet been answered yet is hiding behind a plate of bread and fish? that you haven't given to the Lord yet. Some little thing he may have asked you to do may be holding back a, ma a, a magnificent blessing from your life because it's the little foxes that spoil the vineyard. The, the last thing, what time is it? The last thing I'm going to talk to you about is not being conformed to the world's standards. Say, oh my gosh, that's a toughie. Conform to the world's standards. You know, I have to live in the world. My friends are going to think I'm weird if I, if I don't go out bar hopping. You know, uh, if, I, if I don't go chug down five or six beers with them over a football game. Well, you can go to football. Go watch the football game. Have Coke or ginger ale or whatever. You don't have to have a beard. Well, they'll think I'm a wuss. Well, so what? My wife just said they do anyway. <laughs> But it's amazing how much we'll compromise our walk over something stupid like being concerned how other people who kind of sort of care about us but kind of sort of don't and who aren't going to give up their life to help us in a ma massive situation. And, and so we'll act like we never bumped into Jesus, never mind gave our life to him, just to be comfortable. 
And then we wonder when we pray and we ask God to help us and bless us in life why things aren't happening. It's like we need a V8 moment. Wow, I could have been obedient and gotten blessed. The world standard. So, well, if I don't conform to the world standards, and, and I won't go into great details on, on the world's standards, but it's talking about the beliefs, the values, or lack thereof, and philosophies of a world, that we, an unsaved world we live in, which is totally contrary to the Word of God. And it's getting worse by the moment. Yes. You know you're in a dangerous place when people will sue you and have your land taken away by the government because you plowed a field where a snail darter was. They would rather see you broke and destitute than a snail darter injured. Say, so what's that? They would rather you save the whales but murder babies. They would rather, oh, you can live your values, but don't you dare live them in my face. Yeah. You must believe like I believe in order to be politically correct. You must respect our beliefs. Okay, I respect your beliefs. You have a right to your beliefs. If, if, if a person's not a believer, I'm not going to be expecting them to act like a believer. I'm not going to require that of them. That's right. I require that of me because I am a believer. But when they find out my beliefs may contradict what they want, then I'm evil. Even though I don't try to push my beliefs on them. If I don't accept theirs and welcome it and, and preach it from the pulpit, I'm evil. That's a corrupt world. That's a corrupt world. Amen. Bumper stickers. Like, think world peace. That's a wonderful thought. Unless you've got some guy over uh, somewhere else thinking world dictatorship. We have great philosophical thoughts in the world, but most of them never amount to anything of any significance in life. They'll criticize a person for believing in God, believing in Jesus Christ, and then they'll go out and practice yoga, which is a form of Hindu worship to Hindu gods. But since they want to consider it exercise. I'm just exercise. It doesn't matter if you're exercising. And having been there and having done that and having practiced Hinduism, nothing in Hinduism is done for exercise, not even breathing. It's all to enhance the spiritual realm so that the spirit realm will have access to you and you will have access to the spirit realm. I practiced kundalini yoga. Kundalini, I didn't even know what it meant. I met the guru. He told me some neat stuff. I said, he's from India. That was popular in the 70s. Hey, he must know what he's talking about. So I learned how to sit. I learned how to chant. I learned how to breathe. And then, thank God, I, ran, I, got, I, I bumped into a Christian. And that changed because I was having all kinds of problems. And then I found out kundalini yoga is the serpent method of yoga. And, and its symbol is a cobra. And the sitting, you sit on the ground, you don't sit on a mat, you sit on the dirt, you sit on the earth, you have to have contact with the earth. The breathing is a technique called prana breath, which is bre fire breath. And it's designed to get you into a suspended place of your own thoughts and your own emotions so that the power of kundalini from beneath the earth can come up your spine into your third eye and change your thought processes and your way of looking at things. 
Hello. Well, I just practice yoga. I downward dog. Well, you can practice what you want, but what you don't realize is you're practicing techniques of worshiping a false god, whether they teach you that or not. You say, well, I'm not thinking about any god. False gods don't care. You do something that will open up your pathways within you that it was designed to do that, and you don't have anything in you to keep it, they will voluntarily come and greet you. Because the devil doesn't want your permission, he wants your stupidity. He doesn't need your agreement to harass you. And if he can convince you to act like him and use his things, he doesn't care if, if they call it a game. One of the, one of the, one of the, I was in the occult for years because I loved a game called a Ouija board. You can't, I, I don't want to get into details on that. That's, that's off that. It was, but that's when I met the demonic. That's when I began to see devils, all kinds of crazy, foolish things. My life almost taken multiple times. And I'm wondering, boy, I have bad luck. I did, I'm saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. I go to church. I was a good Catholic boy. I went to Mass. I went to communion. But I wasn't living for God. Left the doors open. Invited him in. I was young, dumb, and having fun, I thought. But the devil didn't care. No. He didn't care. He's in to trash my life. God's in to bless us. And he says, if you'll just walk in obedience, the life you're looking for, you can have. You can be blessed. You will be put in a place where even in the midst of adversity, you'll find me there. And when you don't conform to the world's standards, the Bible says you'll be able to prove what's God's perfect, acceptable, and his good, acceptable, and perfect will. In other words, you'll have great discernment. Right. I'm not going to finish off with that. I'll, I'll do that next week. I just want to give you this. If you want something to do, we talked about obedience. I'm going to end, give you a quick, a quick rundown. Chapter 4 of the book of Deuteronomy. Just write this down. Read that chapter. It talks about God's blessings towards a believer. And this is in one chapter. Here's what it says will come to someone who believes. You'll have long life. You'll have success. You'll have wisdom and understanding. You'll, under, you'll, you'll, you'll experience mercy and, and righteous judgment. You'll have a reputation for having wisdom, knowledge, and greatness. You'll be near to God. God will answer your prayers. You'll have a perfect code of law and life to live by that will not fail you. Right. You'll have good and lasting memory. So don't worry about Alzheimer's. Get God. You will have a law and a lifestyle recommended to you that's worth teaching your children to keep them safe, protected, and grow up the way you'd like to see them grow up. This is all in one chapter, by the way. You'll have, you will have the key to wisdom, which is the fear of the Lord. That's the reverence for God. It gives you wisdom. You'll have preservation from corruption through idolatry. I, my, my, my occult practices and all the different Eastern, European, uh, Eastern Asian religions that I practiced, I was looking for preservation from corruption to find a higher level and what I found was corruption. Only, only the Word of God gives us an uncorruptible guide. Uh, you become a special person. You're a born-again child of God. The Bible says you're adopted into the family. You become a brother and a sister with Jesus, a son and daughter of God Almighty. That's pretty intense. It says you'll receive an inheritance. You'll be made a partaker of, God's, of, of a covenant with God Himself. You will be faith, he will be faithful to you at all times. God will continually show himself to you in, in different ways and in different things throughout all your life just to let you know he's, he's right there with you. He will prove 
to you that he is God. He will give you victory over your enemies. He will give you prosperity. And he will bless your offspring. You say, well, I don't have children. Bible says, many children are to the barren more than those that are fertile. So what are you talking about? He gives you other people's kids. He gives you other people to be a mother to, to be a dad to, to be a brother to. And he will bless you in it. 21 things in that one verse for obedience. If that's not enough to convince you that God's worth following and obeying, you have no concept of what's good in life. And it isn't getting high. It isn't getting plastered. It isn't getting money because all those things have severe downsides. It isn't restriction. It's liberty. So remember this, especially in this season of blessing. When you follow the character recommendations of God, it's like God giving you a Christmas present every single day. But the world has tried to convince us that it's a chain with a giant weight on the end and a prison cell. But the more we are liberated from the Word of God and the, and the, the, the lifestyle of God to the liberation of the world, the worse our life gets. The worse our life gets. Just look around, watch the news, and you'll figure it out. So as you walk in God, you made your commitment to God, know this, even in trials, there are blessings waiting. Look for them. Thank Him for them. Be on the hunt for God's blessings, and they'll come upon you and overtake you, Deuteronomy says. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand up. Father, I praise and I thank you in Jesus' name for everyone that's here today. I ask that you bless them. Let this day be a day of great blessing to them. Let them sense your presence in a way they have not experienced before or in a very long time. Let them know that you love them with an everlasting love and that there's nothing they can do that will separate them from your love and that you are always ready and available to bring them into the family and call them brothers and sisters, sons and daughters because your love is everlasting. And although we are not always faithful, your word says you remain faithful. Your door is always open and your love and your blessings are always available. Let them start experiencing that today and throughout this coming week. Keep them safe. Keep them happy. In Jesus' name.